let's begin reading here in John chapter 20. I'll begin reading at verse, uh, verse 11. And I'll read to verse 18. We'll get into our study. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So Jesus knew how his disciples would take his death. He had taught them that this was going to take place. But he knew that no matter how much he taught them, they were still going to be devastated. And uh, because he knew this, he continued teaching them because he wanted to encourage them to remain strong. Remember when we were in chapter 14 here in the Gospel of John, and we uh, read verse 28, Jesus had said, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father for my Father is greater than I. So he's preparing them. I'm going to go. I'll return, but I'm going to go. In John 16, verse 20, he had said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And so Jesus had prepared them and, and even said that, that the sorrow that they were going to have, which they, of course, have and, and Mary is suffering with right now, is going to be something that passes, a, a sorrow that will lead to joy. And so Jesus had prepared them, and now we have Mary. And Mary and others have come to the, the tomb. They come very early in order to complete Jesus' burial. And as they've arrived, even as we've read, uh, they discovered that the stone had been rolled away. The Bible tells us an angel of the Lord had rolled back the stone from the door. In, in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 28, it says that the angel was speaking to them, and the angel told them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And so the angel has rolled back the stone from the door. Mary Madeline had informed Peter and John that Jesus' body was missing. We saw that in verse 2 of chapter 20 when it says, She ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have laid him. And so she had gone and informed them that Jesus' body is missing. She thought that, that Jesus' enemies had perhaps taken his body because it, it says it here in verse 15 uh, when Jesus speaks to her, she says, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So she thought that somebody had taken the body of Jesus Christ. Well, when they had heard this news, they, they ran to the tomb to see what had happened. Peter and John came. They viewed the tomb as we saw but they had experienced different reactions. Peter only saw an empty tomb, but John saw, and the scripture says, and he believed. He believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And last time we were together, we had ended at verse 10, where it simply said the disciples went away again to their own homes. Now, either they had homes there in Jerusalem, or they went to a friend's home or a rented home, but they left. As the disciples leave, Mary is unwilling to. And she remains behind. She's determined to find out what happened. She's not going to leave. She's waiting, perhaps, for someone to give her information. And so verse 11 tells us that Mary stood outside by the tomb, 
notice weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down. When you look at your Bible and you read that word when it speaks concerning her in verse 11, weeping, if you take notes, you might want to know that's a very strong word in the Greek. She's crying as if her heart has broken. It's not just a simple tear running down the side of the corner of her eye. It's a heartbroken cry. She's sobbing with strong, strong tears. She's mourning with a pain and a grief as if her heart was breaking. Have you ever done that? Has anybody here in this room ever done that? We've done that, haven't we? I have. You know, I, when my father went home to be with the Lord, you know, it was a sudden, unexpected death. And, and I still remember it, it was the hardest thing that I, at that, up to that time, had ever experienced. I still remember when, one night, a few, few days, maybe a couple of weeks after Dad had died, I still remember waking up because I heard somebody was, I heard someone crying. I woke out of a deep sleep because I heard somebody crying. And when I woke up and looked around to see who it was, it was me. I had actually awakened myself because I was weeping in my sleep. Have you ever had a heart that is so broken that you can't even sleep? And when you do, you still cry. Well, that's Mary. That's what's happening to Mary. Mary is weeping. She's sobbing. She's broken hearted. And as she's crying there, she's missing her Lord Jesus Christ. So she's weeping. And as she weeps, verse 11, she looks into the tomb. Verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Why am I crying? Because I can't find Jesus. It's interesting that these two who are seated there, uh, well, it doesn't even disturb her that she's looking at them. They look human. She's crying. She's upset. And she begins just to speak to them. But they ask a question. Notice verse 13. They say, why are you weeping? Now, the reason they're asking her, why are you weeping, is very simple. This question is intended to reveal the root of her sorrow. The root of her sorrow is unbelief. She had not fully understood the promise of Christ. And Jesus had said he would be raised from the dead. So she's crying and sorrowing, but it's really an unbelief. It's a pain that is, is, is rooted in a fact that she, she's not aware. She hasn't really grasped what Jesus was going to do. And so when they're saying, why are you weeping? It's, it's actually revealing the root of her sorrow. It's her unbelief. And, and she responds, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. I, I wanted to come and give him a proper burial. I wanted to show him respect, but he's gone. And so as mentioned a moment ago, the question reveals the condition of her heart. Her heart is, is broken. She loved him with a pure and intense devotion but she's right now not realizing what is taking place. And so in verse 14, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, didn't know that it was Jesus. It's early in the morning. She's emotionally distressed. She's blinded by tears. She sees a form of a man standing behind her. She doesn't recognize him. And so as she glances in his direction, she sees him but doesn't know him. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, shut up. No, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now notice her response. Notice the response. She's supposing him to be the gardener. It's not that he looked like the gardener. She supposed, she made a mistake. She's supposing him to be the gardener. Said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So she makes a mistake. She sees this man. She sees just a man in the garden. She's not really looking closely at him. Her eyes are still filled with tears. She's still in sorrow. It's still a bit dark and all. And so she makes a mistake. She's thinking this is someone who can help her. You see, if he's a gardener, he can tell her where the body of Jesus has been taken. If you've removed him, let me know where he is so I can retrieve him. No, Jesus did not materialize a different body for temporary use after death. 
He was resurrected in the same body he was crucified in, though that body is, is now a spiritual body. Mary made a mistake. It says that she supposed him to be the gardener. But Jesus had been resurrected in the same body. And Jesus, verse 16, said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Ravoni. Um, remember in John 10, where Jesus had spoken of the shepherd and his sheep, and he says when he has brought out uh, all his own, he goes ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. She at first didn't recognize his voice as he had spoken when he had said, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? But this time he spoke to her and he used her name. And he said, Mary. And when she heard him, she immediately responded, this is my savior. This is Jesus. She recognized the voice of her shepherd. And, and it, though it's not saying this, you see by the response what she did because she must have grabbed hold of him. And by the way, the, the word Raboni, he says, which is to say teacher, it's actually stronger than that rabbi is a teacher. Raboni is a way of speaking my dear or my precious teacher. It's a term of endearment. And so she's, she's telling him how precious he is. And, and it, it's obvious that she begins to grab hold of him because Jesus said to her in verse 17, do not cling to me. I'm not yet ascended to my father. You, you can't keep me here in the same relationship we had. So don't grab hold of me. But go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Don't try and keep me here. I am to ascend. I have work to do. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I've already taught you things about this. You cannot keep me here. I need to go. A new work is occurring. I'm not going to be physically present with you. You need to remember, I promise I would send the Holy Spirit, the comforter. I have yet to ascend to my father. So he said, that's going to take place. But I want you, verse 17, to go and tell my disciples. Go and tell my disciples what you've seen. Well, verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she'd seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, when you look at Mark's gospel and compare Mark's account with what we're reading here in John, it's clear that initially these men didn't believe. They weren't receptive to what she had to say. In Mark 16, verses 9 through 11, it says, When he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. They refused to believe. To them, it was like a, uh, uh, it was just a story. It wasn't really a fact. Now, why is it that, she, that he first appeared to Mary? I was uh, asked about that just the other day. And uh, one of the commentators I use, his name is Benson. Benson said this. I think this is a good explanation. He says it much better than I could. Perhaps the men had a mark of disrespect put on them, both because they had with cowardice forsaken Jesus and because their faith was so weak that they had absolutely given up on his being Messiah when they saw him die on the cross. How different was the conduct of the women. Because of this, they were honored with the news of Christ's resurrection and they preached the joyful tidings of his resurrection to the apostles themselves. You know, the men, where were they? Well, they were hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities. We'll see that in just a moment. It says in verse 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst, of, midst and said to them, boo, no, said to them, peace be with you. I don't know why I say that. I'm sorry, but it just makes me laugh. <laughs> Wouldn't you do that? I mean, I, I, anyway, um, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so his disciples were assembled. They more than likely were discussing the events of the day. Notice how John tells us that the doors were shut in, in fear of the Jewish authorities. And that's understandable. After all, if they took Jesus, why would they not be taken? Remember how that when Jesus had been arrested, remember how he had protected his men when they entered in to take him there in the garden, how it says in John 18, 7 through 9, uh, as they came and he said, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And when he did so, they fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. And so initially, when Jesus was taken, they were still protected. But Jesus is now gone. And because Jesus is no longer physically there to protect them, they're hiding from the Jewish authorities for fear that they would also be arrested. If they arrested Christ and put him to death, why would the authorities not arrest him? And so Jesus is no longer physically with them, and therefore they're afraid. And so in verse 19, it says that Jesus came and he stood in the midst and he said, peace be with you. Now, he didn't knock on the door. He simply entered into the room. He had what is called a glorified body, giving him the ability of simply passing through any barriers. And he says to them, peace be with you. Remember, they're assembled for fear of the Jews and his appearance would have certainly scared them. Now, just a few days before, Jesus had promised them that they would have peace. And he had said this to them to prepare them for, the, for what they were now enduring. You see, God can make a promise, but we don't necessarily receive the promise, its fulfillment, immediately. Jesus said, I'm giving you peace. But he gives them peace when they need it. In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He said, I'm giving you my peace. But he also had said, I'm leaving you, but you'll see me again. In John 16, verse 16, a little while, you will not see me again a little while. You will see me. I go to the Father. And so there's this interim period where he says, I will give you peace. Well, they need peace right now. He's entered into a room. They're assembled there for fear of Jewish authorities. As they see him, they're frightened. So he speaks and says, you can have my peace, even as I promise. Now, as this is taking place, verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. He shows them his wounds. Now, he shows them these wounds for at least two reasons. One, he shows them his wounds that they might know that it is really him. When you look, look at Luke 24, verses 36 through 40, it says, As they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. And they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So one, he's showing them, this is actually me. This is how they can know it's really him. But also, the wounds that he shows them reveals how deeply he loves them. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, the prophet said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. He loved us so much that it hurt. And the wounds that he had is an outward reminder of what love does and what it cost. Their souls were so important to Jesus that he was willing to receive these wounds. 
And to see those wounds was a way of reminding them of the depth of the love that God has for them. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that. It wasn't when we were trying really hard to make him love us, doing our best to be winsome to him, to win his affection. No, he loved us while we were yet his enemies. When we were hostily opposed to him, Paul says in Romans 5, we were his enemies, we were opposed to him, and yet Jesus Christ came and laid his life down. And somebody says, Lord, how much do you love me? And he says this much, and he shows the wounds in his hands because the Lord loves us that much. And he demonstrated his love when he gave up his life for us. So he loved us so much that it hurt. Well, the disciples in verse 20 were glad when they saw the Lord. And so verse 21 says, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. And so he's commissioning them. But he begins by saying, peace to you. Then he moves on to say, the Father has sent me and I'm sending you. So peace to you. Peace will come through my death and resurrection. I just showed you my wounds. And that's where peace will come from, understanding this. But the Father, in verse 21, has sent me. And as he sent me, I also am sending you. You're going to go into the world. And you're going to preach the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to preach a message, guys, that is unique. You see, the gospel of God is unique. And it's a message that you have been, that I have been entrusted with. It's a message that is not to be altered. It's a message that is to be communicated clearly. And it's the only message that changes lives eternally. I've had people in the past say that one of the things that they have grown to appreciate about our ministry is that we try to teach what the Word actually says. Well, that's because that's what we're supposed to do. We don't try and make the gospel attractive to people. What we try to do is present it as it is, because Jesus is very attractive when he's presented properly. And we value the message of the gospel, because it's the only message that God has ever given to mankind that can save them. It's the only message that God has given to us that actually transforms us from the inside out. It's a message that promises that God, by his Holy Spirit, will work within us, guys. It's a, it's a promise where God says that he will transform us by the renewing of our mind through, through the washing of his word and the yielding to his Holy Spirit, that we can actually be new creations, that the old things really can pass away, that we who at one time had been, had been uh, ensla enslaved by sin, at one time we were known for the sins that we did, we who at one time were known for being a drunk or, or angry or lust-filled or a, a, a druggie or you name it, you know, just an angry person. We, we, we have been transformed. And when people say, what happened to you? That's when we have an opportunity to say, well, the life-changing message of the gospel. Oh, you got religion. No, I didn't get religion. I already had it. That's how I lived before. I was already religious. I already was religious following my, the dictates of my own heart. I had already created a God that I worshiped, and that God was me. And then I heard a message of Jesus Christ, somebody, God, who took upon himself human form, God, who dwelt amongst men, God, who loved me so much he died on a cross for me, God, who poured out his blood, Jesus, God in the flesh, whose blood was poured out and, and washed me and cleansed me of all my sin. God who said that you can't do this. You're trying to make it on your own, but I can give you the power to be able to do that through my Holy Spirit. And God can transform you, and he does. He does it through his powerful spirit, and he changes our mind by his, by his word. And, and what God did is he has, he has washed us. And I've, I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it again. Somebody says, that's what's wrong with you Christians. You're brainwashed. And of course we are. Our dirty brains need a good washing. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes us from all sin, of course. So yes. So this gospel... Don't be ashamed of it. 
Don't be ashamed of it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, Paul said. I'm not ashamed. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, my father will be ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And he's not ashamed to call you his brethren either, by the way. He loves you. Do you know that today? He loves you. Do you know that, how madly in love with you God is? And you say, how could he be? I know what I am. Yeah, so does he. And he loves you anyway. And he loves you anyway. He knows exactly what you are. Guess what? He knew what you would do with the gospel when he gave it to you. And he still gave it to you. Because you know what? That gospel changes lives. Don't forget that. It isn't because you tried so hard and you became so good. No. No, there's none good. No, not one. It's because he's so good. And he gave us his spirit. And he gave us his word. And he washed us and cleansed us. And we became, became a new creation in Christ Jesus. And this is the message that transforms in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, <laughs> it's the power of God. His men are about to go into the fields. He had early said, earlier it said in chapter 4, verse 35, that these Fields were white for harvest. In order to do so, they need to have authority. And they need power. So Jesus is giving this to them. Notice in verse 21, he says, As the Father sent me, I send you. Now in verse 22, it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how when Adam was just a formless, not formless, just a, a form of a man laying there, God had created him from the dust of the earth. He had formed the man. You remember the story in the book of Genesis of creation. Out of the dust of the earth, God formed man, made him in his image. But when you look at it, it says that God breathed into him and he became a living soul. He breathed into him. I've shared this with you many times. Perhaps some of you have heard this before. How that, when it says in that God breathed into him, that the word breathed, at least some commentators related to an understanding of the nuances of the Hebrew language said that, that God's face-to-face -face breathing was an intimacy. It was, some, some commentators have gone so far as to say that he actually, it was a form of, of closeness and intimacy that could be portrayed as kissing life into Adam to show the intimacy of God. You can almost see God's face. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not making, God, I'm not creating an idol. It, I'm just a picture of God breathing into a, 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 a beautiful, Adam must have been an absolute hunk. He had to have been. He had to have been. Just a very, uh, can you imagine the very first man? What a, an unbelievably beautiful, beautiful, handsome, whatever the word you, you want to use for him. The very first man. Beautiful, but lifeless. Lifeless. Beautiful, but lifeless. Until God breathed into him. And he became a living being. You need God's life in you. And if you're going to be used by God, he gives you the power of his Holy Spirit, his life in you. And so he's giving his life, if you will. The Spirit is entering in. He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And he's breathing on them. So receive the Spirit. You need to welcome, by the way, when he says receive, you need to welcome what, what Jesus is imparting. They need to desire this. It's something they're open to. And so I'm going to be sending you out but I'm, and giving you authority, but I'm also giving you power. And that power comes through the Holy Spirit. 
In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul said, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, this breathing is what is called a pre-Pentecost empowering and a commissioning. It is strengthening them, empowering them, but on Pentecost, they're going to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And as he's sending them out and preparing them for their ministry, he says in verse 23, and this is an interesting scripture, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, I'll say this very quickly, but hopefully clearly. They're not being given the power of absolution of sin. What they are being given authority is to declare that sin has been forgiven. They're going to declare sins forgiven. And sins are forgiven based on the reception or rejection of the message of the gospel. This is not, someone said, an apostolic privilege. It is one enjoyed by the body of Christ in general. This is what it means. If you leave tonight and you're sharing with a brother, sister, mom, dad, grandmother, aunt, neighbor, whatever, co-worker, and you share the gospel with them and you say to them, you know, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And uh, you begin to share the essence of the gospel. And as they're listening to you, you, you can pick up a, that they're receptive. And so you say to them, would you like to give your heart to Christ? And they say, yeah, I do. I've been, I've been wanting to get right with God. And, and so you give them an opportunity and they receive it. You now have the authority to say to them, your sins have been forgiven you. You didn't forgive them of their sins. You are declaring something God has promised. Now, if you're speaking to them and you say, would you like to give your heart to the Lord? And they say, no. Well, you, I'm not saying you should say this, but your sins are retained. You didn't release them. You didn't ask for God to forgive them. They're not being washed. And so you walk away knowing that they're still in their sins. And that's basically what Jesus is saying. When you take the gospel and present it, and whenever I've given invitations and people have come forward and I'm able to speak to them, this is what's taking place. I'm literally saying to them, though not in these words, your sins are forgiven you. Not because I forgave them and not because I have the power of absolution, but because I'm declaring a message that promises forgiveness. And when they receive by faith that message, I'm able to declare, hey, welcome to the family of God. Your sins are forgiven you. And praise God, I can say that not based on my goodness, but because I've given them the gospel. And that's what Jesus is doing here, guys. He's speaking to his men. He breathes on them, says, receive you the Holy Spirit. It's a pre-Pentecost kind of thing. They're going to go out, continue ministry. But on the day of Pentecost, when, when the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes them, that's when the church is birthed. This is what they call just a pre-Pentecost commissioning. And later on, they're going to receive the fullness. And they're able, by God's authority and, and, and the, the promises that they find in his word, to declare what God has decided. Now, as this is taking place, there's Thomas. Good old Tommy boy. Thomas called the twin, Didymus. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. He said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, Because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet 
have believed. Thomas, the twin, that simply tells you he had a brother who was also a twin. And he was a twin. He had a brother who was his twin. And he's called, uh, what's his nickname? Everybody knows his nickname. Doubting Thomas, right? Doubting. How would you like to have that as a nickname? Doubting Thomas. He's known as Doubting Thomas. You know, over the years, I, I, if I were to give him a name, I, I don't know that I'd give him the name Doubting Thomas, to be honest with you. Now, that's a traditional name they've given him because of, because of this. I, I would, I, I'm more inclined to call him Disappointed. Disappointed Thomas. Re remember all the way back in chapter 11, when Jesus was entering into uh, an area that he, is, he was in danger in, in John eleven sixteen. 16, uh, Thomas had said, let's go with him so that we may die with him. He, he was willing to die with Jesus Christ. I, I don't think that he was a coward. I, I think he was disappointed. And as we read about Thomas in Scripture, we see that he, he loved the Lord, but he didn't really understand him. In chapter 14, in, in verses 4 through 6, uh, Jesus said, where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We don't know where you're going. We don't know what you're up to. He was, he was aware of Jesus. He loved Jesus. He's just not really fully understanding the ways of Jesus. And so Jesus had died. And Thomas had found a place of sorrow and privacy. The news that he was alive was too good to be true, even though his friends said it was. Again, I, I don't want to over-personalize this, but, but I can tell you from, from personal experience, and others can share their experiences, more than likely very similar, that there are times in your life, if it hasn't happened yet, it will. There are times in your life where your faith is put to the test in a way that's very extreme. And maybe you're not as prepared for that test as you thought you were. Again, when my father went home to be with the Lord, we were, we were at the, um, the mortuary chapel and it was time for viewing and the family was there. My, my wife, Marie, my kids, my mom, my, my brother and sister, or sisters, I believe. Um, and there's this casket and it's just the family in the room. And, and I still remember while people were speaking while the family was speaking amongst themselves, I went and stood there looking into the face of, of my, my, my father. And I, I, I was staring, staring into his face, looking at my dad, knowing that, that soon he'd be placed in the ground. And, and you know, those are, those are touching, strong moments, very, very grievous moments. They, they really are. No matter how prepared you can be, no matter how prepared you've been, when it happens, it's right in front of you. It's, and I remember standing, looking, and, and I began to think, and, and a, a small voice within me said, do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe in the resurrection? And I remember responding, just me. Nobody obviously knows what you're thinking. My family didn't. My wife didn't. But that's what I was thinking. Do you believe in the resurrection? And I remember as I was there, I, I prayed. I said, you know, God, I have taught about resurrection for many, many years now. And I've presided over many funerals. And I've given words of comfort to many people over the years. This is the first time I've ever asked myself, do I really believe that? Because up to this point, I have always believed that I did believe that. And I still remember looking down at my dad. And I still remember saying, yes, Lord, I do. You are the resurrection and the life. You are. You, you, you stand in a place sometimes when your faith becomes real. When all of the facade and all of the exterior and all of the things that go into who you are are stripped away and, and you're just left with what really is. 
Thomas was like that. And you have to put yourself in his place. He had heard the words of Christ. He had seen the works of Jesus. He had been imparted the spirit prior to this, uh, this event that is being spoken of. He had, he had uh, done so many things, preached so many places. But he saw him die. He, his heart was broken. He was shattered. And he had descended into dis despondency. He had found a place to be alone, to wrestle. And the news that Jesus is alive, well, that almost seems like a cruel joke. It's too good to be true, even if my friends are saying this. So, so for me, I, I am not going to exalt unbelief. God knows that. But I do, I do see an honesty in Thomas. He wasn't hiding disappointment. He, he wasn't hiding unbelief. Jesus' death was so brutal, it left him shocked. It would take more than their testimony to convince him. He, he, had, he had seen what had happened to Christ. He knew how he died. And now Jesus is saying to him, do you want to put your hands into the, the wounds? Jesus isn't rebuking him, by the way. He's offering him proof. He's meeting him where he is. Jesus is aware of what had been said. In Psalm 139, verse 4, there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. And so when they were saying, we've seen the Lord, and Thomas says, I need to touch the wounds. And then verse 26, there's, there's, there's uh, Thomas, and, and Jesus comes, the doors are shut, he speaks, and then he challenges him. He says, you want proof? Reach your, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And what was his response? My Lord, my Lord and my God. Now, I'm going to give you a real quick approach to that. My Lord and my God. There are those who say that Jesus Christ is, is not God in the flesh. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, all of us have spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses. They have come to everybody's door and spoken more than once, probably to you. If you open the door to them, they will speak to you and they will tell you what they believe. And and all in, and they will tell you that that uh, that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. They will tell you this is Jehovah's Witness teaching that that he is Michael, the archangel, the first creation of God. That's what they will tell you. All of you know that if you've ever spoken to them. That's what they'll tell you. So you say to them, no, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And, and the Jehovah's Witness will say, no, no, he's not. He is Michael, the archangel, first creation of God. They'll tell you the, the name Michael in, in Hebrew is who is like God. And so Jesus is Michael. He is the first creation. And they go that route. And so when I've spoken to them, I have said, but in John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas called them my Lord and my God. You need to mark this in your mind because you will have this conversation if you haven't already. In John 20, 28, Thomas calls him my Lord and my God. And the Jehovah's Witness will tell you uh, he was surprised. He was basically just saying, oh, my Lord, my God. And my response is this. And that's, that's what they'll say. And my response has always been the same. No. No, because that's blasphemy. To just use the name of the Lord in vain is blasphemy. Jesus is a rabbi. As a rabbi, he would have corrected him immediately for using his name or using God's name in vain. But he did not rebuke him. He offered him a blessing. Verse 29, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. No, it's not blasphemy what's, what, whatsoever. What it is is a recognition of who Jesus Christ is. Thomas was telling the truth. You are my Lord. You are my God. And instead of a rebuke, his declaration of faith is affirmed by Jesus Christ. He even went on to pronounce a blessing on such who believe like that. 
The Bible in 1 Peter 1.8 says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Thomas had a chance to see him. He saw his wounds and he said, You are my Lord and my God. You and I have not physically seen him, yet having not seen him, yet we love him and we trust him. And that's why Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We have believed, having not physically seen him. And then finally, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did you write this gospel, John? I wrote it so that you might believe. I chose the works that I listed and the words that are recorded so that you would know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that you would know that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is an apologetic, and this is, this is the, an evangelistic message so that you might come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that when John was writing, and I'll close with a couple of thoughts, when John was writing, that there was a movement that had arisen, remember this, that were called the Gnostics. The Gnostics did not believe that the spirit could inhabit the material. The Gnostics believed during the time of, of the writing of the Gospels that, that uh, there is no way that God, who is spirit, would take upon himself human flesh. And so John is convincing those who have been affected by, and he's speaking to those who have yet to be, he is letting them know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's why he began, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh, dwelt amongst us, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. That's why he began his gospel that way. He was writing as an apologetic to those who were being infiltrated by Gnostics, and he's closing his gospel by reminding them, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus Christ was, was resurrected from the dead. Thomas could have reached and touched this physical body of Christ. He wasn't a spirit. He was a resurrected body. He had a resurrected body. That's the whole point that he's making. And I'm writing this to let you know, but I also want to declare the truth so that you may believe who Jesus Christ actually is. When somebody first gets saved, you probably were told this. What is the first book they tell you to read? The Gospel of John. Why? Because of what we just read. That reading, you will be believing. That was the first book they told me to read when I got saved. They said, you need to read your Bible. Start with the Gospel of John. Because John tells you why he wrote this. Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you have any friends that you want to have uh, to come to faith in Christ, encourage them to read the Gospel of John. One last little story, and we'll close with prayer. My mom, when she first got saved, and she had been a Christian a couple of years, I went into the military, got out, I was living at home. When I was living at home, my mom said, a woman has come and wants to, she wants to um, teach me the Bible, son. And my mom wanted to learn the Bible. And I'm a new Christian myself, but I've, I've already started to study and I've already started moving in the direction of, of growing in my understanding of the word and all. I was about 23 at the time. And she says that she's a Jehovah's Witness and she wants to teach me the word of God. And I already had had some encounters with people from that particular cult and and so I said to my, my mom, well, let me talk to her. I didn't really know that much yet about what they believed in all, but I did know a few things. And I still remember this, this woman coming to the house and uh, talking, wanted to talk to my mom, but I was there. And I, I said, well, I'd like to talk to you. And the woman said, of course. And I said, uh, you're here to want to teach my mother the Bible. And she said, yes, I am. And I said, well, that, that's interesting. I said, how about this? How about you and I studying the Bible together? How about you and me? You know, I got my mom out of the situation and wanted to talk to her myself. 
And she says, well, yeah, I'll study with you. I said, wonderful. I said, let's study the Gospel of John. She says, oh, no, no, we can't do that. And I said, why not? She says, no, what we have to do is we have to study the materials that the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Organization, gives to us. We have to go through their study plans. And I said, and why is that? She says, because that's how you learn the basics of, of Christian faith. No, I knew otherwise, because I knew that uh, the guy who had, who had started the, um, the Jehovah's Witness organization had uh, Charles Taze, I think it was Charles Taze Russell, if I'm not mistaken, Russell, uh, had, uh, it's been a long time since I remembered his blasphemous name, but it's been a long time <laughs> since I thought of him, but um, he had written that, he said, if you, read the, if you read my materials and read the Bible, you will remain in the truth. But I have discovered that if you read the Bible just by itself, that it's a short time that you are no longer in the truth. Even the Russellites, they were called the Russellites before Watchtower Organization took over and Jehovah's Witnesses became their name. And so he said that it was reading the Bible that took him away from being in a Jehovah's Witness. And I knew that. And that's why I told her. I said, let's read the Bible together. Oh, no, I can't do that. I said, no, no, we should. Let's read the Gospel of John. And I'll tell you what, you can read and explain to me what you're reading, and then I'll explain to you what it's saying. She said, oh, no, I can't do that. And she wouldn't do that. You know why? Because the truth sets you free. And the way that they stay in bondage is they keep them from the truth. And so when you read your Bible, John just told you, why he wrote this, that you may believe and that you might have life in his name. There is no other source of spiritual life, guys, outside of the word of God. Never forget that.